The first one is the provision of international liquidity, uh, uh, which is uh, you know what you know in the jargon of of this topic is called the global reserve system. What are the currencies that provide that liquidity, uh, and, uh, and how to arrange the availability of that liquidity? Uh, and let me say that uh, in that regard, uh, uh, the dollar is still, of course, the dominant currency. Uh, but we may be moving uh, in a direction of a more multi-currency system. In fact, the euro has survived relatively well in recent years. Uh, its role as the second currency, and the renminbi is gradually becoming uh, a third uh, important currency. And there are, of course, minor uh, agents. Now, of course, aside from China, if the renminbi is successful, uh, no country in the South will enjoy the benefits of being a provider uh, of a global currency. That's why I think for the developing world, for the South as a whole, it is quite important what the international community does with the only true international currency that we have, which has this funny name of a special drawing rights of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, that's the only truly global currency. It was used during the crisis. Here in London, uh, in, um, uh, early in the crisis, there was a decision to issue uh, $250 billion uh, in a special drawing rights. But this, is, this issue is, uh, was largely uh, uh, useless. Uh, because of the, first of all, because more than 60% go to developed countries uh, that don't need it, and, and secondly, because uh, it is not, not uh, very used uh, uh, elsewhere uh, in other transactions. So for many years, uh, some of us have been making a proposal to make an active use of this instrument, uh, and that should be a major, it's a, it would be good in, uh, reform to the extent that all developing countries will benefit from the uh, creation of international money. Uh, but more importantly than that, I think, uh, I think is the, the, the proposal that has been made for you know, several times, uh, and I think should be uh, seriously discussed, uh, of making the IMF entirely uh, an institution that operates in special drawing rights. Which means, among other things, that is the issue of a special drawing rights will become the major source of financing of IMF lending. Uh, which is a, you know, a proposal that um, I think should be at the center uh, of anything. The second issue is macroeconomic cooperation. In this regard, there has been an advance uh, in recent years uh, in, uh, in what is called the mutual assessment process of the G20, which is the most elaborate system of its sort uh, ever developed, I would say. Uh, but uh, let me say it has been entirely useless. Uh, uh, because he hasn't avoided the creation of a new imbalance, which is the surplus of the euro area, uh, which is totally uh, counterproductive from a global perspective. Um, and in fact, since surpluses have to be determined by deficits, so have been counterbalanced by deficits elsewhere, I have been arguing for a long time that the deficit of the emerging world is the counterpart of the surplus of the euro area. So the surplus of the euro area is one way in which the international financial crisis has been transmitted to the emerging world. In a sense, we are paying for the uh, surplus of the euro area. Uh, you know, you, know, you th think of it in global terms. And therefore, you know, a very, you know, much stronger instrument of cooperation, including a very useful use of, you know, more useful use of this mutual assessment process uh, is, uh, is required uh, going forward in the future to avoid these sort of situations. The third issue uh, is the issue of, of capital account uh, regulations, or what other people would call capital controls. This was a no, no, no uh, prior to the crisis in the era of you know, liberalization of the capital accounts, et cetera, et cetera. Very interestingly, the IMF revived this issue uh, in recent years and gave it legitimacy uh, as sort of this family of what are called now macroprudential policy instruments. And, and for the emerging world, I think this uh, developing country, this is, a, I think, a very important point uh, because, uh, you know, since most of our financial crises are transmitted through the capital flow, the volatility of capital flows, how you regulate those capital flows is one possible instrument uh, to manage. And in, for example, in Latin America, Chile has done that in the past, Colombia, Brazil, you know, several countries have used some form of regulation of capital flows as an instrument to manage macroeconomic volatility. Uh, the major problem here uh, is the fact that, as the IMF uh, pointed out in its uh, uh, 
documents uh, in agreement of called the uh, uh, on the capital account regulations uh, that you know many free trade agreements and um, and investment agreements in, so in, in uh, pushed by the United States essentially not by Europe uh, essentially forbid the use of this instrument so at the, at the, on the one hand the IMF revise the instrument, on the other hand, the free trade agreements and the investment agreements um, continue to, uh, to forbid it. The third point, the fourth point is, is, is crisis resolution. And there are two subtopics here. The first one is countercyclical financing. And in this regard, um, uh, the major form of countercyclical financing is nothing else but the swap arrangements between the Fed and the, the banks of developed countries. Uh, but developing countries, except for a short period of time during the crisis, uh, four of them, you know, Brazil, Mexico, uh, a, a Korea, and, um, a, and Singapore, uh, do not have access to that form of financing. Uh, so for, for, the, the, uh, for, for us, the, the major innovation was the flexible credit line uh, of the IMF, uh, which I think is the beginning of, of a long route uh, of creating more uh, IMF loans uh, which are not conditional. Uh, in the traditional sense of the term, uh, such as the swap arrangements are not. You know? uh, so the, I think going forward, uh, this is a line that has to be pushed forward uh, in, in order, uh, among other things, to eliminate uh, the uh, reluctance of developing countries uh, to use uh, IMF credit lines. And the other, the other issue is the, the lack, the entire lack in the world of a mechanism to manage a, a sovereign debts uh, when uh, they become unsustainable. Uh, and uh, of course, we are going through one of those crises, which is the Argentinian one, in a, let's say in the repetition of a former crisis. Uh, but uh, in the, my understanding of it, it was generated by a, a misjudgment of a U.S. court uh, a, and the reluctance of the Supreme Court to, to take the case and, and review it. Uh, but anyway, uh, I think it has raised the point of the need again to, to have a much better mechanism to manage uh, sovereign debt uh, problems. Uh, you know, uh, 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 at the end, I think the world needs a, a sort of bankruptcy court uh, of an international character. Uh, there was some interesting innovations last year approved by the private sector and by the IMF uh, to, you know, to better manage, uh, uh, you know, sovereign debt uh, bonds. Uh, but still, that's only I think half a way in uh, in, the, in uh, for a solution. The fifth uh, issue is the need for more regional arrangements. The regional arrangements, I mean, I have been for a long time uh, I, I arguing that the, the international monetary system of the future it should be a network of regional funds with the IMF being the apex of that system. And that that system would give much more stability to the world uh, than the, the system that relies only on the IMF. Uh, uh, now, uh, this is an area in which uh, we actually have in Latin America a, a sister institution in, historically to, the, to CAF, the Latin American Reserve Fund, which is one of the most successful institutions, but it's a small one. Uh, but it could be used uh, you know, by you know, ma all of Latin America becoming members. Uh, there have been many proposals in that regard uh, to become a sort of a Latin American uh, monetary fund or reserve fund. Uh, uh, now, th there are two other inst interesting institutions in this regard, the, the Chiang Mai Arrangement uh, of East Asia, uh, which is, uh, you know, in, in size is, uh, is the most important of all, uh, and now the BRICS uh, consistent, uh, Contingency Reserve Arrangement uh, that was uh, also launched in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Brazil after the World Cup last year, right? Very important was after the World Cup. <laughs> but the, uh, anyway, the... Uh, 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 I must say that is, uh, I found uh, one of the criticism of the of the Chiang Mai arrangement it has been not being used because after 30 percent of the credit lines they have to have an IMF program, uh, so no East Asian economy has used it, uh, and I was you know you know surprised that the BRICS also uh, agreed on that on those terms uh, that it has to be uh, after 30 percent they have to go to an IMF program. I I I was I was shocked. I thought they, they were going to have a, a much better uh, mechanism. Anyway, so it may become useless, as they, so far Chiang Mai has been entirely useless because those countries don't want to use uh, a mechanism that has an IMF program behind it. 
And finally, there are the reforms of the global governance, uh, a, and, a, and by far, of course, a, the most direct, directly important issue here is the reform of IMF quotas uh, to increase the, uh, the share um, a, of the uh, of developing countries of the South, let's say, in, uh, in, the IM, in IMF voting power. Uh, uh, this basically means, if you, you know, look carefully at the numbers, increasing the share of Asia and reducing that of Europe. I mean, that's in uh, the U.S. Uh, in any uh, uh, scenario uh, is uh, not very much affected, and that's why it's shocking to see that the U.S. Congress has not approved, uh, despite the approval by U.S. government uh, of the uh, reform of the uh, 2010. Uh, and this year, according to the uh, 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 agreement, there should be a, a new uh, negotiation of an IMF quota, which is, of course, very difficult if the previous one has not been approved. I think I will end with that. Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Jose. That's a wonderful. <laughs> Excellent. So may I now uh, introduce uh, Harinder Coyle, uh, Cole, who is President of Emerging Markets Forum, who's going to speak on regional and sub-regional development banks and uh, sources of development finance. And is there a new paradigm, Harinder? Uh, let's look at it. Um, this is an interesting issue. I think it's a very topical issue. I think the number of institutions need to look at that point. Uh, especially with the recent announcement of both a BRICS bank and a China-sponsored Asia Infrastructure Fund, which will be both huge in amounts compared to some of the existing international institutions. Uh, but before I talk about the new paradigm, if you would, some of my ideas, uh, perhaps we should revisit the history, where we're coming from, uh, and therefore think more about where we should be going. Now, the genesis of the so-called multilateral development banks, MD, MDBs as some people call them, goes back to the post-World War II effort to consolidate peace and to promote both reconstruction and later on development of the world. Uh, at that time, in 1945-46, uh, there was a clear demarcation between the so-called part one, or developed countries on one hand, and so-called part two or developing countries on the other hand. It was very clear as to who belonged to which category, uh, leaving aside the issue of Soviet Union. Uh, part one countries were mainly in the north, um, much richer, capital surplus, and had superior know-how, both technical and managerial. They had much to offer to the developing countries, most of them were just emerging from independence, except in Latin America. But in Asia and Africa, uh, developing countries were recently becoming independent, and they had much to catch up with. The part two countries were mainly in the South. They were much poorer in capital deficit, and very often had very, very insignificant institutional infrastructure. So they needed a lot of catching up. Now, on the basis of this background, the multilateral development banks were created primarily to transfer capital and know-how from part one countries, the so-called donor countries, to part two countries, which are called the recipient countries. So all of the policies and basic governance structure of these institutions reflected what I'll call the post-World War II power structure. And you just mentioned them basically, the two sides of the Atlantic. Uh, and that has lasted until recently, until the debates about what happens in the fund came up. But before that, there was also, you remember a few years ago, a movement saying 50 years is enough for the World Bank. And uh, that was a questioning of what was happening in these institutions. And now, of course, there's much more questioning and much more action. Now, on basis of that background, just to remind you, we are the following international financial institutions. The global institutions like IMF and the World Bank, World Bank being on development business. There are regional institutions like the Asian Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, the African Development Bank, and the most recent European Deve Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which focuses on emerging, the so-called transition countries. 
these were set up some years ago, but in last few years, there have been some new developments. For example, suddenly, number of private foundations led by the Bill Gates Foundation have started creating the so-called vertical funds, like the Global Fund for AIDS or malaria. So now we have major actors from the private sector coming and working on some of the issues related to social development of the poorest countries in the world. And frankly, in some areas, they have more money than even the World Bank expends on the same issues. And so they're big actors. They are not side issues anymore. Uh, in addition, of course, we've heard this morning about the BRICS Bank, and I just mentioned the Asia Infrastructure Fund, which is being promoted by China. Now, I should remind you that the world's largest development bank actually is European Investment Bank. European Investment Bank traditionally has lent a lot more than the World Bank, and today lends about 60% more than the World Bank. And they've consistently remained the development bank with the highest credit rating and the highest speed at which they can make loans to their member countries. The interesting thing, and I come back to that later on, they are in a way a cooperative. Their borrowers and shareholders are the same. They don't have any non-borrower shareholders unlike the World Bank or IMF. And that has a major implications for the way they are managed. And maybe that's one of the reasons why they are very attractive even to countries like Germany to borrow from them for development assistance for infrastructure. So this is the current scene. I want to add just one other thing. Unlike what the impression is, in all regions except Africa, the regional development banks I mentioned to you lend more money than the World Bank in their region. And if you add up all of the development, regional development banks together, including EBRD, they lend roughly 70% more money worldwide than the World Bank does. So I think even though many of the regional development banks are considered second tier, in the regions themselves, they're the first tier. And there is, of course, one exception, which is Latin America, where in addition to the World Bank, you have two region-wide development banks operating, Inter-American Development and President Garcia's CAF. And both of them lend more than the World Bank does. So just keep in mind that when you say development banks, it's not just my old institution, World Bank, there are many other actors, and the scene is changing quite fast. So where do we stand today in terms of global scenery before we sort of sketch out a paradigm for the new regional development banks? Today, unlike 1945, 1950, Asia is capital service, surplus, huge amounts of money, particularly with China and Japan, but also other countries, Korea, um, Singapore, etc. while certainly US, but G7 countries as a whole, are capital deficit. Second, there is increasing shortage of concessional money uh, through which the multilateral banks, including World Bank and IDB, for example, or Asian Development Bank, fund projects for the poorest people in the world. And this is happening both because the incidence of poverty is coming down in many parts of the world except Africa, and secondly, because the countries, the donor countries, have increasing budget deficits and difficulties. And they're finding hard to get their parliaments to approve more and more concessional money or grant money. So that's very important implications for the future. The other thing is that billions of people, as I implied, have been lifted out of poverty during our lifetimes in the last 50 years. This is one of the great success stories, if you would and the fastest rate at which poor people have come out. And today, the incident of poverty is down from about 70% in 1950 to closer to 20% of total population. So in terms of where people stand today, we are living in a very different world. And if you project to the future, things look at even better from the perspective of developing countries, the current developing countries, or the so-called South. Uh, the other thing I should mention is that in terms of global governance, as we heard this morning, G20 is increasingly playing a more active role than the G7 used to or currently are. And if you look at the list of G20 countries, 
12 countries are those which earlier were classified as the South, or developing countries. Some, of course, have, have graduated, but in terms of the configuration of the top 20 economies in the world, we already are saying, seeing major change in structure, and therefore economic power indirectly. Um, so, uh, the final thing which to add, which we must remember with President Lagos uh, implied this morning, that the private capital flows today are much, much, much greater than the public sector flows. To the ratio, he mentioned this morning, 80% of investment is by private sector and only 10 to 20% is by public sector. And in terms of capital flows, uh, private sector capital flows are even bigger ratio than public flows, transfers from developed to developing countries. So in terms of importance, while absolute size is increasing, the role of the development banks in relative terms is smaller today than it was 20 years ago or 40 years ago. So within that, how does one construct the new paradigm for a regional, not a global development bank? And I would submit that there are seven features that perhaps one should think of in designing them in terms of principle. One, that these institutions' main role will be to intermediate savings and knowledge, but basically savings, if I can say, from the so-called South to the borrowers in the South. For example, a lot of surpluses are there in Asia, and regional development banks will need to find ways to intermediate those savings and put them into regions, countries, where there's a shortage of capital. So instead of intermediating, if you would, savings or capital surplus of rich countries, they'll have to go to a different sort of country. That doesn't mean they don't come to New York or Frankfurt or London, but basically the savings are originating in a different part of the world today. Second, and maybe because of that, but more fundamentally, the regional development banks of the future, in my view, should think of a different governance model. Governance that involves like a cooperative venture between the shareholders and the borrowers who will be the same, like the European Investment Bank. And I think in that sense, CAF comes very close to it because as President Garcia mentioned this morning, 95% uh, of CAF's capital is held by countries in the region who are also borrowers. Third, learning from experience of the World Bank and its criticism, I would suggest that it is very critical that the regional development banks of the future have a very simple authorizing environment than is prevalent in most of the multilateral banks today both regional and global like the World Bank. So in a way, if I was redesigning IDB today, I would think of very different shareholding and very different authorizing environment than it exists in IDB today. And therefore, they will have to worry less about the Senate and the House that Dan was talking about this morning. I think there is also the need for regional development banks to have a very laser-like focus on issues that are critical to the region itself, to the region's future prospects. Now, that doesn't mean that they should ignore the global commons. They have to make a contribution to global commons, but the basic focus has to be what is necessary in the region. For example, in Latin America, what is necessary to close, if you would, the current gap between rich and the poor, how to raise productivity, how to increase, if you would, uh, growth rates. Um, but other things should not come in way of focusing on these fundamental issues. And quoting President August from this morning, I think there'll be totally new set of customers that we have to think of. In the past, the development banks thought of the poor of the poor as the main customers. He reminded us this morning that the size of the middle class is exploding. In future, I would submit, particularly in Latin America and East Asia, the main beneficiaries, the ultimate clients, will have to be the middle class people and what they need and how they need it as incidence of poverty continues to drop, as I hope it will. And second, I think 
there will be much greater role for private sector and therefore a key function of the future development banks should be how to unlock private capital flows, how to unlock private investment, and therefore pay much more attention to public-private partnerships and working with the private sector. So with those, if you would, basic principles, I would suggest that a new regional development bank, for example, for Latin America, should have the following attributes. One, it should contribute to the longer term vision, vision for the region as a whole and lift people's sights so that they continue to develop faster and catch up faster with the so-called developed countries. And that will erase, in my view, in the next 20, 30 years, the current boundaries between North and South. And I think we'll have a continuum of countries because as it is today, as you see, Singapore and Korea and Hong Kong and Taiwan, which were considered poor countries, very much part of South, they today belong to OECD and they belong to the developed countries. And I think we'll see increasingly more and more countries coming in that way. And this is the kind of vision I think a regional development bank has to play. Secondly, they have to be a source of both finance and knowledge. Knowledge about what's happening in the rest of the region, what the needs are, but also what is the experience in other parts of the world, including developing parts of the world. Third, they'll have to be very agile. They will have to be quick. And this goes back to my point about uh, govern governance mechanism. Uh, you need to be agile to work with private sector. You need to deliver on the expectations that the middle class has. And therefore, you cannot take seven years to develop a project and approve it, another eight years to execute it. So by the time you thought of a project and it is completed as a period of 15 years and the world may have changed totally. So we have to think of faster movement by the institutions, both on the ground but also in internal decision making. Next, the institutions have to have much lower transaction costs than are currently involved in going to a multilateral institution and getting agreement on policies and project compositions. Uh, these new institutions, I think, had to be much closer to the clients than is possible for the current multilateral development banks. They have to be much more focused on a few issues instead of trying to do everything and try to please everybody. And finally, and this is the lesson one can draw from successful versus less successful institutions, there has to be tremendous emphasis on professional excellence of staff and the kind of knowledge type, type kind of expertise which comes with the financial assistance. So with that, I think for a region like Latin America, perhaps one can draw a framework that most of the thing an institution should be doing should follow these. One, inclusive growth. Two, improving productivity and competitiveness. Three, sustainability. And finally, as our keynote speaker said this morning, regional cooperation and strategic projects. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lots of great ideas there. Thank you very much. So we turn now to Africa, and I'm going to ask Jean-Louis Ekra, who's president of Afrex in Bank, to talk to us about building African regional infrastructure and the rise of South-South development finance. Over to you. Yeah. That's, thank you very much, Maxine. And, um, let me first uh, extend my appreciation to President Garcia for associating African Export Import Bank to this kind of event. Uh, it's not the first time. We were here last year, and we are here again. Uh, it's for us the sign that Africa matters. Before I cover the subject, let me also take the opportunity of having the floor uh, to make a small comment on what Harinder just talked about. Back in 2006, 2007, I was attending a forum in Oslo on African agriculture. When I talked about reviving the agriculture development banks, I was almost crucified. <laughs> because if you remember, 
That was the era of the so-called Washington Consensus, when no development banks were to survive. So I'm very pleased to hear that now we are talking about strategy of those development banks rather than uh, killing all of them. <laughs> That's the comment I wanted to make before I start. Our institution, African Export and Pearl Bank, has repeatedly stressed the need to improve infrastructure as a necessary but not sufficient condition to raise intra regional trade and accelerate the process of structural transformation within the region. So that's why I really welcome this uh, platform, which gives me the opportunity to exchange with other experts and participants on a topic of great significance for the development of Africa. The way I want to articulate my intervention is first to discuss the importance of infrastructure in trade and economic development. Then I will review the cost benefits of closing Africa's infrastructure deficit. I will also highlight some of the key factors hindering the development of infrastructure in Africa, discuss a few of the initiatives that uh, has been undertaken to address Africa's infrastructure deficit. I will also elaborate on the implication of deepening South-South cooperation for infrastructure development. And then I will consider the role played by African Export Import Bank before concluding. Infrastructure is a, an heterogeneous term encompassing both social infrastructure, such as school and hospitals, and economic infrastructure, like network uh, utilities. These network utilities include energy, water, sanitation, transport, and digital communication. The infrastructure, uh, the importance of infrastructure for trade and socio-economic development is now widely uh, recognized. Essentially, infrastructure is one of the key factors that drives competitiveness and productivity growth as it improves economic activity and help to reap the benefits of economies of scales by enabling countries to produce goods and services at lower cost compared to their competitors, thus contributing to higher economic growth rate and poverty alleviation. According to the latest uh, IMF economic outlook, raising public investment in infrastructure by one percentage point of GDP would increase the level of output by 0.4% in the same year and by 1.5% after four years. The, therefore, infrastructure is so important for growth and economic development that China recently established the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank to finance infrastructure projects in the Asia Pacific region with a view to accelerating the process of economic integration. It is also important to note the key role played by infrastructure in the integration of socio-economic development of Europe, particularly in terms of infrastructure that were connecting cities and rural communities, which has led to the convergence towards a common market characterized by a deepening of intra-regional trade. Africa 
compares unfavorably to other developing regions in terms of vital economic infrastructure. For instance, infrastructure data published by the World Bank indicates that Sub-Saharan Africa has the lowest electricity production capacity in the world. Only 32% of the population of Sub-Saharan Africa had access to electricity in 2010. Similarly, Africa had the lowest quantity and quality of transport infrastructure measured by the density of paved roads as a percentage of total roads. Very often, the persistence of Africa's infrastructure def de deficit has been partly attributed to the legacy of colonial history. However, the African infrastructure landscape of post-independence era is not completely uniform. There seem to be clear evidence that African countries with relatively better infrastructure landscape have historically recorded stronger trade performance than others. It's the case of Algeria, Botswana, Egypt, South Africa, and Morocco. Let's look at the potential cost of and expected returns for closing Africa's infrastructure deficit. In practice, the direct economic benefit of closing Africa's infrastructure deficit are significant, including economic growth and improving the competitiveness of African countries in the race to foreign direct investments, health and welfare improvement. From an economic standpoint, closing African infrastructure deficit could accelerate the process of economic growth by narrowing the gap potential and actual growth. The output gap is explained in part by infrastructure deficit. Unreliable and non-existent power could be a two to five percent drag on economic growth in the region, suggesting that Africa could leapfrog into the league of double-digit economic growth rates enjoyed by Asian emerging economies for decades just by closing the infrastructure deficit. For those who don't believe that those leapfrogs are possible, let's look simply at the telecom industry. Africa is now the leader in uh, mobile payment by telephone, telephone uh, mobile payment. And it's been replicated in some other part of the world. Let's look at the challenges constraining the development of infrastructure in Africa. The lack of adequate financing has been cited as one of the key contributors of low level of economic infrastructure in Africa. The financing need for infrastructure development and maintenance in Africa are significant. According to Africa Infrastructure Country Diagnostic, the country's, the continent infrastructure financing needs stands at about $93 billion per year. Out of those $93 billion, currently African government spent about $45 billion per year in infrastructure, which leaves a financing gap of about $48 billion every year. Further, the lack of limited cooperation between national governments and regional bodies on cross-border matters has also been blamed for the persistent infrastructure deficits uh, across the regions in the continent. There have been some recent attempts to address infrastructure deficit in Africa. In 2010, African leaders launched the Program of Infrastructure Development in Africa, which is called PIDA. 
It's a joint initiative of the African Union Commission, the NEPAD, that is a new partnership for economic development, and the African Development Bank. There's also another important initiative which is led by President Obama, it's called Power Africa Initiative, which is a five-year initiative. The governments of economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, are also embarking on very ambitious regional infrastructure projects. And they have put together a project preparation and development unit, which is to assist countries in uh, defining the needs for uh, infrastructure and preparing projects. Over the past five years, the African Development Bank had delivered $5.4 billion uh, in critical infrastructure investment. Looking at the implication for South-South Development Finance, I would say that apart from China, which has been playing a significant role on the ground in Africa. On, on the South-South basis, very few other countries have matched the effort that China has been making in the continent. China has created the China Africa Development Fund, which is a subsidiary of China Development Bank, which has financed projects in more than 30 countries in, in, uh, in Africa. To the exception of Brazil, Latin America has been a relatively small player in the recent drive in Africa that is known as the rise of Africa. When you look at the map of Latin America and the lab map of Africa, it is clear and evident that these are pieces that were together before. Uh, so what Africa and Latin America needs to do now is to bring back those two pieces where they were before uh, the, 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 the break. From the African export in Poland perspective, we've been developing uh, cooperation with SCAF, that's why I'm here today, uh, with BLADEX, the Latin American Bank for Development of Exportation, with BNDS, and all those institutions were part of the global network of Exim Bank and Development Finance Institution, which we created in 2006, which was essentially to foster uh, development of trade between uh, countries of the South. Banks, regional institutions in this, the two continents, and the three continents, have been meeting regularly to look at how to diversify trade. We believe in the importance of diversification. In other words, in multipolarity world, uh, to the benefit of all uh, continents. Now, let me conclude, I'm asked to shorted my speech, but I'll, I'll conclude. Infrastructure is really uh, a prerequisite for sustainable economic growth and development, as it is a reliable source to support trade, production, marketing, and distribution of goods and services. There have been various initiatives which I've been undertaking and their success in overcoming Africa's infrastructure deficit will definitely depend on whether the requisite financing can be mobilized and whether African countries are committed to strengthen cross-border collaboration and deepen the process of regional integration. Our bank, Afrexim Bank, will continue to support trade and trade-related infrastructure structured products through the various programs and facilities 
and his strategic partners and in support of intra-African uh, trade. Thank you. Thank you very much, <laughs> Thank you. We'll return to our last speaker, um, Professor Matthias Spector from the Fundacion Getulio Vargas, and who is also the CAF LSE Fellow for this, well, for tw 2014 and 2015, I take it. And you're going to talk to us about the new BRICS Development Bank, whether it's niche banking or alternative banking over to you, Matthias. Thanks so much. Good afternoon. So I've been asked by the organizers to say a few things about the BRICS New Development Bank. And I'll do, try to be very brief, and I'll say four things. What it is, uh, why was it set up, to what effect, and what can we tell about the geopolitics of the Global South when we look at this bank in particular. So. What's this bank? It's fairly straightforward and relatively simple. It's far less than what the media have portrayed. This is the five countries chipping in $10 billion each to set up a bank that will finance infrastructure in BRIC countries and perhaps in other um, middle-income countries and low-income countries. Uh, the structure is relatively simple with 50 billion US dollars for starters, the comparison is very clear. The Brazilian National Development Bank alone last year loaned $88 billion, and the Chinese bank loaned $240 billion. And Brazil, India, and South Africa alone borrowed $66 billion from the World Bank. So the BRICS New Development Bank is a relatively simple operation. Of course, it's bigger, it will be bigger, because it doesn't exist yet. It will be bigger than CAF, but CAF is growing very fast. So we'll have to see. So the first message is, this is not super hyper ambitious. It's relatively low cost, but it's low cost for very big gain. I need to be gain for the BRICS countries, because being an emerging country is not merely a function of what you do or the natural attributes of your country. Dan Restrepo earlier today was saying, why the BRICS? How about Mexico? That question, why not Mexico or Turkey or Indonesia, points to the fact that to be an emerging country in the 21st century, you need to be perceived by others as an emerging country. Being an emerging country is something others attribute to you. And by setting up a new development bank, the BRICS countries are trying to give some meat to the notion that actually they are big emerging nations that need to be reckoned with politically. Let me say a little bit about why this was set up beyond that calculation. The major reason is business. The business of lending for infrastructure is a very good business and CAF is a great example of that kind of success. Over one billion people have no access to clean water. 2.6 billion people need access to sewage and electricity in this world. Giving money for these kind of projects pays off remarkably well these days. And all these countries, the BRICS countries, have been playing this game at some level for a while, perhaps with the big exception of South Africa, but the others have, and the profit margins are relatively good. So the first answer as to why are the BRICS doing this beyond giving meat to the notion that they are big BRICS in the new global order is business, not so much geopolitics. The second answer as to why do this has to do with fear. And with the fact that post-2008, the fear was very real in all BRICS capital that there could be an external shock coming from the developed world that would turn the boat for these emerging economies. These emerging economies, as you know, had benefited remarkably from globalization in the 90s and the 2000s. They'd done remarkably well. That was the period in which they had become emerging economies. And all of that came under threat 
in 2008. And the important thing to highlight here is that contrary to the notion we oftentimes have in our heads that the world is divided between status quo developed nations in the North Atlantic versus the emerging rest that might be revisionists in their ambitions. 2008 shows that for many developing countries, revision was coming from the North Atlantic. The source of the threat to the status quo was not coming from the developing world, but from the heart of the international financial system. And the rationale behind not so much the bank, but the one institution that the BRICS set up next to the bank, which is a system for loans. It's not a mini IMF. Lots of people made that confusion. The BRICS have not set up a small IMF. It's not a fund. It's a set of bilateral agreements to loan each other money if that money is needed in the case of a crisis. This picture is a picture of countries that are afraid that fundamental changes in the way the global economy operates might derail their process of ascent. So fear was the second one. The third one, Professor Ocampo made a reference to this already, is frustration. In every single brick capital, there's an enormous degree of frustration with the lack of progress in reforming the Bretton Woods institutions. I don't have to go at length, but the notion is that there is a problem with the way power is distributed inside these organizations. The fact that Belgium will have more voting power in the IMF than does Brazil, do Brazil or India, is revolting for these countries. And the BRICS New Development Bank is not going to change that, but it sends a signal but as I'm trying to suggest, this is a very low cost signal. It's not about wrecking the boat. It's not about proposing a new global financial system. It's not about revolutionizing the system in any detectable way. On the contrary, it's pretty conservative. As Ocampo pointed out, it's in cooperation with the IMF. Because after all, the IMF protections, for all the problems of the IMF, have shown to protect economies that lend money. And this is what these countries now uh, need. To what effect, what are the impacts of the new development bank? So the first one is that lending for infrastructure is going to become more competitive. Indeed, we've seen this already. Before the BRIC countries announced that they were going to set up the bank, when this hit the media, the World Bank Group got its act together, came up with a new scheme for sub-Saharan Africa, and the new scheme does not echo the voting structure of the World Bank itself. It gives far more weight to recipient countries. So we're gonna see more competition in this market, which is, as I said, relatively profitable uh, these days. The second effect is, of course, the challenge of coordination for the BRIC countries. Remember how long it took the World Bank to come up with a joint understanding for members of what sustainable development means. We're going to see an awful lot of struggle among the BRICS countries to decide what transparency is for the bank, what it is to be a responsible, an environmentally responsible lender, all these issues promise to produce an awful lot of heat within the BRICS group. The third effect is that we're now going to see, far more than we have before, the power imbalance among the BRIC countries. We all knew that there is a fundamental inequality of power inside the BRICS, that China is far more powerful than all the other BRICS put together. We also knew that India does not see itself in the same category as South Africa and Brazil. And we all knew that Brazil doesn't see South Africa in its own category either. So all these conflicts are bound to come to the fore uh, more clearly, I think, as the bank gets to be implemented in the next few years. Let me now focus, and with this I will close, on what the impact of all this is for the way we understand geopolitics and the global south. 
And the first thing is that now people begin to talk about the global south. I was talking to an FT editor this week, and I was saying that I was coming to this global south meeting, and he said, what is the global south? This is an FT editor. And when I explained it, he said, why not call it the developing countries? And that's not an obvious, the answer to that is not obvious, right? So the first impact of all of this is that Global South begins to gain salience that it didn't have before. We're going to see master's degrees popping up called the geopolitics of the Global South, I'm sure. More seriously now, I think the first thing this shows is that the divide between a world of status quo industrialized countries versus revisionist emerging countries is fundamentally false. There is nothing status quo about US financial policy. There's nothing status quo about US policy in general if you look at the Middle East or if you look at Latin America. Obama and Cuba, that is not status quo. It's the very opposite of status quo. It unsettles countries that are used to the status quo. And when you have a group of countries that have benefited from the status quo in the 90s and the 2000s, and those are the BRICS, suddenly the world is not as obvious as Foreign Affairs magazine will suggest, right? Foreign Affairs is the chief proponent of a world of the West versus the rest. And what we see with the BRICS Development Bank is that it's not the BRICS versus the rest, it's more messier than that, it's a BRIC collage, right? Far messier than that. The second issue has to do with what Bob Zelig used to call the responsible stakeholders. The notion that emer big emerging countries need to show that they are responsible stakeholders has a fundamental problem, and the problem is who gets to decide what responsible behavior is? And the response to 2008 is a good example that, as Restrepo said, where you sit is where you stand, right? Whether you're responsible or not is not a measure of um, an independent set of measures, right? It depends on where you're sitting in the world. Two final things, one on Russia. Whenever you talk about the new, the new um, development bank, everyone asks me, because I'm Brazilian, they ask me, what the heck are you doing? Why are you in bed with Mr. Putin? What about reputational cost? And I am always baffled by people in the North Atlantic asking about the reputational cost of being in bed with Putin, because the cost is so minuscule there is a cost, of course. But if you're standing in Rio, or if you're standing in Delhi, that reputational cost is negligible compared to the wins that I've just described. And I think that's very important when people look at the bank and how the bank is bound to evolve, even if Russia is not, according to many, an emerging country, but a submerging one. Let me say something as well about China. Lots of people then ask, what about China? How are you going to manage China? Why would you go into bed with China if the asymmetry of power is so vast? And the answer to that is, precisely because the asymmetry of power is so vast, precisely because the Chinese will not treat Brazilians as equal, the bank is so important. It's one of the few instances in which Brazilian authorities have the chance to talk to the Chinese as equals. There are many opportunities for Brazilian leaders to voice concerns to Chinese leaders. And this is a problem for Brazil because China is Brazil's trading partner number one. Trying to lock in China in conversation is not an easy task for any country, but certainly not for a country that is far weaker than China, and that's the case for Brazil. So yes, the asymmetry is enormous, but at least that asymmetry now exists within an institution. And you can play all sorts of institutional tricks to try not only to lock in the Chinese, but also to tie them down. And I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, we have some time for questions, so I'm going to open the floor and uh, just remind people to please uh, give their name and affiliation and also not to um, contribute at too great a length as we don't have a huge amount of time. So uh, am I seeing some hands up? Yes, Stephanie. I, um, I work at IPD, Columbia University, with this distinguished professor Ocampo, and uh, I'm also emeritus at Sussex. Um, I wanted to follow up, actually, on Jose Antonio's very interesting presentation, uh, looking at it from a European perspective. We haven't talked at all about Europe here, and uh, the Eurozone is not growing at all. And we have a problem of macroeconomic management, exactly like the one that Jose Antonio was talking about in global terms. Even though Europe, the EU, has had uh, such a long institutional development, it doesn't really have good manage macroeconomic management. And secondly, we have an election happening in Greece in about a week's time, and um, a party that's likely to win which will ask for major debt restructuring. And we had an orderly debt workout mechanism like the one that Jose Antonio and others have been proposing. Um, this would have been very handy to have in Europe. So I just wanted to ask, what are the implications of what is happening in Europe, both in terms of the impact on the emerging economies, but also what these countries can learn maybe from, from emerging economies? Chris, one from you, please. Sure. Thanks. <clears throat> I just wanted to ask the, the panel. Um, I was at Busan in 2011. An uh, enormous amount of effort was made to distinguish uh, developing country perspectives, or rather emerging country, India and China in particular, with Brazil sort of playing a mediating role of some kind, uh, running between the, the various delegations so that there was a, a final position on what development in the 21st century would look like. The story that I hear, more or less, on the panel is one that there isn't that, despite the political posturing in Busan, there isn't that much that's distinctive and characteristic. I wanted to, to, to say, did I get the story right? Was, or what was Busan about then? <clears throat> Let's kick off with these two while other, oh, there's one at the back. We'll, we'll take one more, yes. Good afternoon, my name is Mehran Amini and I'm a student. As you know, yesterday, uh, Central Bank of India unexpectedly uh, decreased and cut the interest rates. Mm. And uh, I want to know how does it impact uh, India's economy and is it impact positively? Uh, would it be sustainable or it will be in a short term? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll start with this Antonio, please. I think you can answer all the right No, certainly not the last one. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I have okay, a... You're the best place to answer that. I can do that one for us. And the second was a difficult one. But I actually start with the second to talk about geopolitics. I, I, I really think that the... Uh, I mean, this goes among the, uh, you know, along the lines of the heterogeneity of the South, and even the heterogeneity of the BRICS that was, um, Matthias uh, was uh, presenting, because I, I think what uh, keeps, uh, a, let's say, the, let's call it North, dominating the um, international financial institutions is a, a stable coalition between the U.S., Western Europe, uh, they say the North uh, Atlantic, except that you can include Japan as part of the coalition, they say. So, and of course, Australia and New Zealand. I mean, they, but you know, that, but the, the Japan is the important uh, additional actor. Uh, and the, you know, that coalition is very strong. Uh, and that's why, you know, any reform requires a, an equally strong coalition uh, on the other side. I mean, the BRICS uh, are, the, in a sense, the hope of an alternative coalition. Uh, but they have shown uh, so far to be relatively uh, weak uh, in, uh, in that regard. Uh, uh, not to say the uh, broader, let say, developing country coalition, which had collapsed like two decades ago, uh, or three decades ago. Uh, 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 although. By the way, there is one particular issue. Uh, I had never seen a vote 
for many years uh, uh, along north-south lines. Uh, as much as the, the, the vote last year, uh, November, I think, uh, on the United Nations uh, General Assembly resolution uh, on that. Uh, that's the first time I have seen a long, you know, many years, a strict north-south vote, uh, a, that uh, which may be, uh, you know, the beginning of something. Uh, uh, but you know, I don't see that. Uh, and uh, so the, uh, I have always said that you know I will believe in a, a strong uh, developing country coalition uh, when I see a strong coalition between China and India. Okay, that's the beginning of a strong coalition, and so far uh, it's a relatively uh, a slippery coalition, let's say. So I, uh, that, that's my answer to the second question. And to to, to Stephanie's uh, point, I, uh, I I think that first of all there is a, an implication that, that of course Stephanie herself has done a lot of work and with many others uh, about the role that in development banks play in developed countries, which is in fact you know, the European Investment Bank being the largest multilateral development bank in the world, uh, but somehow it doesn't have has not shown uh, this you know. The decision uh, to to become a major player uh, for the European recovery. You know, from my perspective, uh, the uh, the major problem uh, that I see, you know, is uh, is of, uh, from the monetary perspective is as I pointed out, uh, the rise of the European surplus, uh, the euro surplus, it's not European euro surplus, because you know, Brit Britain is a deficit country. <laughs> Britain is a deficit country. Uh, so the, the euro surplus uh, is, uh, is today the major imbalance uh, of the global economy, uh, you know, from the point of view of the balance of payments, um, uh, which was not, I mean, Europe as a whole uh, was in a relatively balanced position uh, in 2007. In fact, it was a slightly deficit position. Uh, so that, that surplus, which is the result of, of two Opposite phenomenon, which uh, is, I think, I, to my students, I said, you know, John Maynard Keynes, you know, uh, a, a, in his writings on during the Second World War, uh, before the uh, creation of the IMF, had this, you know, very strong reflection that the basic problem of, the of any international monetary system is that deficit countries have to adjust, surplus countries do not have to adjust, and that basic asymmetry is the result of a recessionary bias during crisis. Uh, uh, and, and the best example, as I, and I have the graph for my students, is the euro area in the last six, seven years. Uh, all deficit countries, you know, Spain, Portugal, Greece, uh, Ireland was not a deficit country actually, it was a slightly deficit, but it had a different kind of problems. But those three countries uh, had, to, had massive adjustments. Adjustment that we had never seen in a developed country, uh, as far as I can remember in history. You know, 10, 12 percentage points of GDP. In Latin America, we have seen those adjustments in the past. But not in Europe. <laughs> uh, ever Europe, <laughs> never Europe. Uh, we have seen those adjustments, uh, and, and the only way for the Euro, the Euro area not to generate uh, such a massive you know, uh, surplus would have been for Germany in particular, but also for others like Austria, Netherlands, uh, which are also surplus countries, uh, to uh, reduce their surplus. But that doesn't, has not happened. The German surplus has continued more or less uh, 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 unchanged. Uh, the Dutch surplus actually has increased. Uh, and so overall, the result is that you have, you know, the euro area has generated a massive net surplus. And that, it, of course, has to be paid by someone. And that's my point. Part of the problem of the emerging world today uh, is that we are paying for the surplus of the euro area. And I think that's a major, it, it does a major macro, global macroeconomic repercussion of the euro area surplus. There are other things. For example, the, the instability that we're going to see uh, in the currencies, the major currencies, I mean that, you know, uh, with the, you know, of course the, the, the yen has been, uh, uh, has depreciated substantially uh, uh, associated to the policies of the, uh, of the Japanese government. Uh, uh, but the yen is not a major global currency. The euro 
is a major global currency. I mean, the second global currency. And a strong depreciation of the, of the euro, I think, has you know, several implications. First of all, for the United States. So, you know, per, you know yes, the, the US dollar should probably appreciate, as it is doing now. Uh, but uh, you have a st very strong appreciation of the US dollar, which is the main global currency, uh, that may generate problems of its own. I mean, in the past, every time the US has had a strong appreciation, it, it is followed by a major global crisis uh, when the adjustment takes place. So I, I'm not totally sure that, that the, uh, the, the strong appreciation of the dollar is the solution. Uh, but the other we saw uh, yesterday uh, is, uh, you know, it forced Switzerland to abandon the, the uh, uh, its parity with the euro. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, which of course has major implications for Switzerland. But, you know, you cannot sustain, uh, you know, the uh, a situation of, a, a, you, know, you know, the very massive adjustments taking place among the major global currencies. And I think that's, you know, that's another form of instability uh, that we had actually not known for some time, but we are living uh, through exactly right now. Thank you very much. Anyone else want to come? Yeah, I just want to add from the, from the African perspective, I, I think the fact that uh, we are now dealing more and more with great countries, including China, is helpful. Because if you go back to about 20 years ago, such a, a recession in Europe would have massive repercussion on Africa. Essentially because uh, historically all our commodities were going to, uh, to the West, essentially in Europe. Now uh, China has become the largest trader, uh, single country trading with Africa. So it helps. It helps that diversification help. The same way uh, it has helped that uh, during the uh, financial crisis of 2008 and 9, uh, Africa was not as much as fact affected by the financial and economic crisis as was uh, Europe. Um, back to your question, and push on. Um, let me offer a slightly different perspective. I think when negotiators go to places like Busan or Geneva, uh, the professional negotiators, and they are trying to fine tune the languages on what they think their leaders want. In my view, the actual action is in the informal sessions during G20 between heads of states. That's where actually the decisions are made in principle, with or without advice of, uh, if you would, lower level officials. I think the dichotomy between developed and developing countries, north and south, is overdone. I think we are in a process of major change in the world economy. Uh, the pecking order is changing. Uh, certainly in terms of size of economies, not per capita income yet. I cite, cited to you earlier the examples of Korea, of Taiwan, of Hong Kong, Singapore. They were considered poor, amongst the poorest in the world, um, including Singapore and Korea in 1950. And today they are amongst the richest in terms of per capita income. In terms of overall size of the economies, uh, in PPP terms, you know, of the top three economies in the world, two are in Asia. They are both from the South, China and India. So uh, I think the leaders in the countries are looking what's happening and where they're going. Now, our own work indicates that by 2050, we should expect to see the so-called today's South, the developing countries, to have as much as between 60% to 65% of global GDP in PPP terms. Okay? Uh, we should see perhaps out of the 20 largest economies, 14 or 15 from emerging markets, today's emerging markets. And people are looking at that. The, the incomes are changing. So my view is that instead of looking at today's situation and thinking that you are either sitting on this side of the table or this side, that side of the table, or either you are a member of the club, who's sitting inside versus people are looking from the outside, we'll increasingly see the club being expanded. Some people who until recently were witnesses from the outside, with jealousy perhaps, 
they are not entering the club. And the global economy is their club now. You know, what happens to the world economy is as important to Europe and US as it is to China and perhaps India and Brazil. So the common good is going in the same direction. So I would submit that we need to think differently of a round table where it's not them versus us, it's all us. That we need to think about sitting around the round table, how do we find a joint solution? And I give you two very recent examples why that is important. The deal between India and, and US on trade probably will unlock WTO negotiations. The deal between China and US probably will unlock the climate change deal. So you need the big countries, in my view, maybe because I live there, without US you still can't do anything big in the world. Okay, they can't do it themselves. That is also clear. But without them, you can't do it. So I would submit that increasingly, we'll need to look at today's G20 and see how do you for formulate coalitions to solve common problems. So this, I would urge not to think in terms of us versus them, north versus south. That era is behind us, in my view. Thank you. Matthias. Very briefly then, to conclude, I think listening to, to these responses makes it very clear, I mean, it's slightly a depressing conclusion, that after all, one needs to read Henry Kissinger, right? Because <laughs> Kissinger's point is that you do not have a stable international order without sources of legitimate hierarchy that organize the world. And part of the problem with the way things have gone, in particular for Europe now, is that those, those sources of authority are no longer there, obviously. And the notion that the club is expanded and we all now sit down and try to do it together, this is the echo of the 10s and 20s. This is the preface to disaster, according to people like Kissinger. So I guess the big challenge is, can we come up with something better than that? History suggests, not really, but it'd be awful if we ended up in 2014 having to read that as a guide to the future. In terms of the, the question about um, what's distinctive about development in these emerging countries now, I think there is only one element that is distinctive, and it is this, that the concern with social inequality that is all the rage in the West now has been around the developing world for a long time. I went to Zuccotti Park during the protests and people were so excited about it. But that's the story of Lima and Caracas and Buenos Aires in 1983 and 1984. And Thomas Piketty's book is not selling well in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that it's those similar. kinds of arguments have been there for such a long time that they are actually the norm. Krugman, translated into Portuguese has no appeal because that's what you read from every columnist, more or less. It's not exceptional in any, in any detectable way. That's not to mean, of course, that the global south has something to teach the global north. It's simply to say that, again, where you sit kind of shapes where you stand. I think that's a very good place to uh, end this session, in fact. It is now half past three. We are meant to take a 15-minute break. <laughs> so anyone who has burning questions, I advise you to come and talk to the panelists informally now. But perhaps it's time for a break. I'd like to, uh, if you can join me in thanking the panel for an excellent set of presentations.